Hey everyone, welcome to the Will Ad Podcast. I'm James Marshall and this episode was brought to you by Straight Face Razors. If you are sick of shaving with a dull blade, then go give these guys a try and you'll get a whopping 50% off your first order by using the code LADS, which will give you four sharp five blade heads and a razor for only $15. It's crazy cheap and all you have to do is go over to wadlad.com, click the Straight Face logo down the bottom and it'll take you straight there with the discount all ready to go. Also, Waterlad Coffee is now available. This is the best coffee bean in New Zealand, made by Pomeroy's, and we've partnered up with them so that every lad has the right brew to start their day. Comes in three options, whole beans, espresso or filter, and you can order by heading over to waterlad.com and click on the Pomeroy's logo. It'll take you there and some big prizes coming up over the next few weeks for anyone who purchases some coffee, so watch this space. Anyway, let's get to today's episode. Intro, please. What a lad, and today I'm honoured to have one of the best coaches in the game on the podcast, but before he was a great coach, he was a great player, where he played for Taranaki, Hawke's Bay, Natal Sharks, and even represented South Africa at Sevens. As for a coach, he coached Swansea, Wellington, the Sharks, Ireland, the Hurricanes, Japan, and now, of course, he is the assistant coach of the All Blacks, and on top of all that, he is one of the greatest lads in the game. It is the great John Plumtree. Welcome, Plum. Oh, thank you very much, Jimmy. Very honoured to be here. Um, am I the first coach on this podcast? No, we've had Andrew Goodman and um, Chrono, but you're the biggest named coach, that's for sure. What a CV you've got. No wonder you got the All Blacks job. <laughs> oh, mate, yeah. Shit. You've made me feel old. Oh, that's a lot of jobs, eh? You know, that's a lot of places I've been exited out of as well (laughs) yeah i didn't say you were there for only six months (laughs) but how's it going what's your job and role at the moment uh how's it going uh it's going okay i mean obviously tripping around a lot in the country just viewing players and you know selection um stuff with foxy and fozzy and sort of pour my heart and soul to the video you know watching individuals and taking notes and um, and then we've got, you know, many Zoom calls during the week, um, that time of year, really. And now yeah. I've actually just started doing a little bit of club coaching, so getting around a few of the clubs in um, Wellington and oh, nice. uh, doing a little bit here and there, just getting a whistle around my neck and getting ready to go for, what, about a month's time. True. So how much footage would you actually watch in a week? Must be huge numbers. <laughs> I don't know how much footage, but I know a lot of hours. You yeah. Know, um, Monday, Tuesday, big days once I've downloaded the games onto my laptop. And then as the season goes along with the players, um, you know, I've got a pretty good handle on all the players. I sort of narrow it down to um, watching the individuals that I've really um, got to keep an eye on. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, you do get sick of watching footy a bit, I must <laughs> say. But um, just sort of break it up a little bit, break the day up a bit, just get the balance right in your day and, and uh, come back in fresh and, uh, that's what I try to do. So how close are you to picking your side? Like, is your side sort of penciled in or is it pretty much penned in except a few positions? How does it, how does it sort of work, the whole selection process? Uh, no, the nice thing about working with Foxy and Fozzy, they're very experienced selectors, um, obviously been in the all-black frame for a long period. So um, they stay very open-minded um, around selection. And we have discussions, um, you know, probably every two or three weeks to, together, but we have regular uh, catch up phone calls and stuff. So, uh, but really, it's um, yeah, they stay pretty open minded. It's not like we've got we haven't got thirty five written out at the moment or anything like that. Mm. So uh, we'll wait till a critical date when we have to have it nailed, and then we'll we'll do it. How many would you have down at the moment, roughly? Um, you you trying to work out whether you've made it to me? <laughs> you promised me <laughs> you'd pick me. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just trying to work out where this question is, where this question is going. No, you're, sorry, Jimmy, I'll tell you right now on your podcast, you haven't made your backs. Oh, oh, there's our first headline. <laughs> Marshall misses out. <laughs> oh, no, <I'm> <laughs> uh, Any sort of bolters sort of put their hand up for you? Who's who's impressed you in the comp? Who's impressed me? Um 
Yeah, I don't want to give too much away. I yeah. mean, obviously, my focus is probably more around the pack. Um, and D, isn't it? Like, you you mainly just watch <laughs> players defend. You don't really care how they attack, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no, I actually do have to swing my attention a bit more towards the ball as well, Jimmy. So, um, but, yeah, I've been really impressed with the um, Chiefs pack, the way they've really stepped up yeah. in this competition. Um you know, Tupavai's having another good season, which is really good to see. Mm. And um, yeah, it's good to see Luke Jacobson playing some good footy, consistently playing some. So if you just look about talk about loose forwards, obviously the loose forwards that we had last year in the All Blacks, they're all there. Um, but it's good to see a couple of others coming back into the frame, like like a Luke Jacobson. Yeah. Uh, and Ethan Blackadder being pretty consistent as well. Yeah, good to go. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just avoiding injury so staying um fit and well and getting some good game time and so um but in you know Shannon Fazal's been really consistent performer down there. Obviously we've got the, the locks uh, um all there, the Brody coming back from Japan, which yep. is good news. So he's available straight away, him and Bodie? Uh yep, I believe so. Yep. Oh, yeah, cool. He'll be available. Um so they'll have need a good break after the Japan season obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they I mean, they yeah, they're, and there's, I've been really impressed with some of the, the forward play and a couple of props really um, growing their games as well. Um, um, at the at the Chiefs, the, those boys are going good, been going good. Mm. Um, Crusaders, George Bowers has been playing well, getting more game time since Moods' injury. Yeah. So, yeah, it's good to see. Tough job, eh? So what, what about at fullback? Obviously, it's a huge position. A lot of people talk about this one. There's so many options, so many good options. Have you? Has anyone stood out for you there, or are you thinking probably Bodie's going to keep that dual playmaker role? Uh, well, it's certainly an option for us. I mean, um, Bodie there with Richie at 10. Um, but, um, you know, Damien McKenzie's played the house down at 10 and 15 as well. Yeah. You know? So he's been real consistent this year in his game. And, um, you know, Geordie... Um, Obviously for the Hurricanes, mm. um, so yeah. Look, I mean that's a pretty contested like like the back three as well. We've got some good wingers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the it's good to have depth in those positions. Sure is depth everywhere. And what what have you made of the comp, the, especially the Trans Tasman comp? Like, is this giving you a lot of confidence watching this comp, or it doesn't really cross over to the international setup? Oh no, it doesn't you know like internet. One thing I did learn last year that international footy is just so different to to super footy. You know, just a step up in everything around pressure and uh, particularly um, intensity. You mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, you slip a, you slip a jersey on, you represent your country. You you put you you tend to your game tends to go to another level um, at, you know, individually and collectively. You know, so. Um, Oh, it's, it's just great for the players that they, um, you know, we've stopped playing against each other week in and week out, and they've got now to play with some different opposition, and uh, it's great. I think great for the spectators as well. So thank, thankfully that Trans Tasman uh, tournament started. We're not as selectors, not to worry about results. We just worried more about um, just how the boys are playing, keeping the boys, you know, hopefully the boys staying healthy and fit. Mm. Yo, and you're obviously a good Hurricanes man. Do you still supporting the Hurricanes more than the other sides, or has that had to go right out the window? <laughs> no, I'm totally neutral now. Ah, yeah. So. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm totally neutral now. No, I have to be. It's. Uh, I still obviously wander down to uh, the ground and yeah, sit with uh, the boys on the camera and the injured and, guys uh, and uh, chat away. To the yeah, to the boys and just um, just try and keep my distance as much as possible. But you know, uh, it's great. Still, you know, maintaining relationships is really important to me. And um, you know, Hurricane's a big big part of my life. But um, you know, as as it happens, you know, we just um, we have chapters, don't we, as players and as coaches. And mm. I guess for me right now, that chapter's closed and a new chapter's opened. And speaking of chapters, you've had so many chapters in your career, so we will try and get through as many of those chapters as we can. But I want to start at the start for your young John Plumtree down in Hawara. What was it like for you growing up? Oh, pretty small town. <laughs> um, you know, everything revolved around uh, getting out of school as quickly as possible <laughs> and going to the freezing works so you could make some cash 
and have fun with it. <laughs> uh, shouldn't be shouldn't be saying that, but no, it was it was pretty <laughs> pretty small town. Um, rugby cricket dominating my life. Um, yeah, from a yeah, played club rugby really early, and and then got into the Taranaki side pretty early in my life, and and um, and yeah, sport pretty much dominated, but. It was really a case of a pretty early age. I decided that I couldn't live in horror all my life. I had to get out. Yeah. And um, that was my decision to go to South Africa. True. So what age did you go to South Africa? Uh, I was 20, just oh, might 21. I might have just turned 22. Oh, yeah. really? And what was what was that decision, just to get out of and why, why South Africa? Yeah. <laughs> From Harwood to South Africa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, oh look! I mean, I was I was always fascinated as a kid with the um, all those earlier tests and the days where you know the you know came on TV at three o'clock in the morning and the All yeah. Blacks Cavaliers and even before that when Andy Hayden was a All Black captain and see what show my age now I think it might be seventy six but I, I I can I love watching the South Africans play on those hard grounds against the All Blacks it was sort of like yeah. it almost felt like a different world to me you know and um, and then I contacted uh, I, can, I contacted Colin Meads and uh, spoke asked him about South Africa because I know he had a real affili- affiliation with South Africa and um, actually actually yeah I, was, I gave him a quick call but he didn't have t- too much time to talk to me so we at Taranaki ended up playing King Country and Tika Woody and I saw him in the club room so I sort of like wandered over <laughs> and waited for about ten minutes till I could see he wasn't talking to anyone I just sort of meekly walked over and said, hey, uh, Colin, it's John Plumtree, and um, I just want to ask you a question about South Africa. And he goes, oh, go to Durban, you know. That's yeah. a good place, lots of English speaking there, and blah, blah, blah. So he gave me a good heads up. And um, and then I contacted a club in Durban, and, um, yeah, you know, they just, um, you know, those days it was, um, yeah, a guy picked me up at the airport, but you didn't get any flights paid for, there was no accommodation or anything, you just pretty right. much, <laughs> I put you up for a week and then you're on your own, buddy. So it was a real, uh, it was a real adventure, that's for sure, for a young guy from, a, brought up on a farm in Hauru, it was pretty conservative and everything else, it was great. So you were already playing for Taranaki at this point, before you were 21? Yeah, I was, I played about 40 odd games. Wow. I started playing. When I was about 18, yeah. You must have been a gun. What was what was the rugby like back then? Because obviously it was a completely different game to what it is now. Must have been pretty intimidating for a 18 year old kid from Hawara to go into that sort of set up pretty old school environment, I'd imagine. Yeah, that was it was it was. But luckily that uh, in, the, in those days the Taranaki Ford Pack was full of some pretty useful customers. Like Colin Cooper was the man, you know. Oh yeah. He, he was a number eight. He was like, you know, a few years older than me. I respected him. He looked, he had a real thing around looking after the youngsters. And, um, and, uh, so yeah, so a couple of times he had to, when I got a bit scared in the line, he had to swap positions with me, put me somewhere where he's a smaller guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I was really like that. Bad, but we had, uh, we had some really good, um, tough old Taranaki sort of forwards and, and they looked after the young fellas, so it wasn't too bad. So then what was it like going over to South Africa as a 21-year-old kid? Did you feel safe over there? Because that's one thing when we travel over to South Africa, always talk about the safety yeah. of um, life over there. Yeah, I was sort of like a little bit naive really going into all of that. It was really just a case of, I, I didn't, in those days we didn't have the technology around, you know, Googling something quickly to yeah. find out about something and finding it was going in really cold, you know. Yeah. And like, and, um, I, you know, obviously I, I knew the, um, the situation that South Africa was in around part eight and all of that. I did my enough homework around that, but, um, there were lots of things that I didn't like over there when I, when I arrived, but I saw some of the black people living and, mm. um, but there was nothing you could do at the, at the time. Obviously, everything changed in 1992 when Nelson Mandela was released, and I was actually living in South Africa there, and it was it was awesome. But um, yeah, up until that time, my focus was really about footy and settling down. And and um, I played for the, played for a club team there, and it was only about probably five or six games of club rugby, and then. Ian McIntosh, who was a famous Natal coach, went on to coach the Springboks, and they came to watch me play and. Invited me to Natal training, and that was obviously Natal has gone to the Sharks now. The brand changed, mm. and um, yeah, so uh, I went down to training and made the 
made the shark squad. All the Woodland listeners remember your rap video that you did for the Natal Sharks, where you, <laughs> where you spit some of the best bars any freestyle rapper would be proud of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that video has been played a lot. <laughs> Someone that, when I was with Japan, uh, they found it as well. And the, the Japanese just loved They dined out on it. They were playing it after the, in the changing room afterwards. And Brownie was like, Brownie was like, he was driving all of that. I'm sure of it. He was probably worse than you with that so, yeah, Hopefully, it's been played out now and it's gone and forgotten and never seen again. <laughs> How did you get roped into that? I couldn't imagine you being that keen to be doing a rap. No, no I think they did a just a, pr- a big promotional thing with some of the Mattel players, and it was uh, around that shark song. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, that's how it all. Did you write your own line? No, no, no. But I did all say that it's, I had one take. There you go. Oh, a yeah, natural. One take. Okay, that's done. I'm out. <laughs> Thank God. Because I knew some of those Afrikaans boys, they were struggling with rapping. <laughs> they didn't really sound like uh, really good rappers with that Af- Afrikaans accent, you know, for beauties. James Small was good. I don't know if you remember him. Oh, that's good he stuff. Was, he was really good. Mm. And then what was it like on the field over there? I played just four seasons of Curry Cup rugby. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Curry Cup was the, the big competition, but it was extended. You played against heaps of other teams. Uh, and they had a couple of other trophies to play for as well. Um, but Natal wasn't really a... You know, all the strength of South African rugby was really Transvaal, Northern Transvaal, uh, Western Province. Um, and Natal was seen as a bit of a sort of, yeah, okay, well, they, Natal... And I think anyone who's been to Durban, uh, even the Superboys now going to Durban, would say that after the games, you know, the, in the car park with the, uh, yeah. you know, the celebrationary, uh, you know, bries and drinks and everyone comes to rugby there and it's a big party afterwards. It's a great place to play, you yeah. know. And I think that's how the rest of the country saw Natal as being, yeah, they're not being football players, but they're really just party boys, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and uh, so that was that was a good part of it for a 22-year-old, I have to say. Uh, making the team and and playing in uh, two or three years of Karaka rugby before super started, but it was really, um, yeah, it was really it was really fun. But it was at the same time, Ian McIntosh was determined to change the Natal side to become a force, and so he recruited uh, really well around the country. And and because Natal, because Durban's such a beautiful place to to visit, um, a lot of the boys that were living in Bloemfontein and you know, and, 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 and Joe Berg and that wanted to come down and live in Durban, plus mm. the sea. And by that time, we were attracting a little bit of a money around sponsorships and stuff. So we, we managed to build this team up and became um, pretty good. So in 1990, um, I've been there, obviously been there for about a year, and, and we we formulated quite a good side, and we won the Curry Cup for the first time in uh, Natal's history. Jeez, you turned them around quick. So, <laughs> yeah, I turned him around quickly. No, no, we did. Uh, no, I can't, I can't say it was me. No, actually, um, a, bit, a little bit of a story around that, though, for some of the South Africans listening to this podcast would love it. But um, Ian McIntosh, in those days, I think there were six subs, and I was named on the bench for the final um, against Northern Transvaal. And that, and N- Nas Borta played, um, and uh, obviously some real legends of, of the game playing in Northern Transvaal. They were clear favourites. You know, the bookies, it'll be, it'll be, they'll be 20 to 1, you know. It's oh, like, yeah. right out there. They yeah. even had, like, they even had their champagne with champions written up <laughs> and party ready to go afterwards. It was, it was, it was just, uh, it's just going to happen, you know. And anyway, we had a, actually, another big guy played for us, an Australian called Tom Lawton, a big hooker. He played for us that year. And, um, and we had other, we had other ideas and we ended up winning this game and, um, yeah, and spoiling their party. And creating a real massive one for us. True. Yeah. Did they give and you I, the champagne? I, yeah, but you, they uh, sent all their champagne to our <laughs> change room. It was awesome. But I, I actually came off the bench that day for a, as a super sub oh. with 25 to go, and now the loose foot I replaced had to limp off because in those days you, you, you couldn't just say, oh, get number six off, you know? Oh, true. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, he had to limp off, and it was a sort of a start of over there. They started, oh, okay, the – Clicking on to okay, well we can put these got the fresh guys on just by <laughs> others limping off, you know. <laughs> so he made a big so, impact. Yeah. Made an impact in the last twenty years. Oh, yeah. what a game! Yeah, yeah it was good. It's fun. 
Well, and was it that impact that got you selected in the South Africa sevens side? Talk to me about that. I wouldn't <laughs> picture you as a sevens player, but you got in there. Oh, yeah. No, look, I mean, um, yeah, like, like I said, back in those days, there was not a super rugby, so we, all we had was um, sevens tournaments at the start of the season to really get fit for the 15s. Yeah. So the sevens tournaments were down in Stellenbosch, and um, they were big. They were big tour- it was a big tournament for uh, South Africa because from there the, the South African team obviously got selected and um, and we were invited to Hong Kong. So um, I made the Natal team, went down and we had a good tournament, won it. And then, yeah, I was just, we were just all milling around and the fires going and we're having a few beers and everyone was there, the, all the teams. And the Louis Late, a famous uh, Transvaal president, stood up to name the well, he was a South African president at that time. He he, he uh, stood up to name the team, and it, and I heard my name mentioned. I thought, well, it must be a mistake, yeah. And because uh, I'm a, I'm am a New Zealander, you know, and but in those days there was no you had to play three years. <laughs> oh, years true. So bang straight in. <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, so, no, the, the Springbok Seven is funny, but uh, that it was a really good side actually. We and we we got beaten the quarter final uh, by Fiji. And those were the days when, um, you know, Rushy was the kingpin for New Zealand. And yeah. Matt Jonah, Lee and Cully was there. And there was a great New Zealand side that sure. won it two years I was with the South African team there. Um, but we had a pretty good side too. We had Jus van der Vestazen, uh, halfback. And, yeah. And uh, Andre Jabir, a fullback. Uh, Chester Williams, a winger. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we had some pretty, pretty – pretty good players mm. too so yeah it's good fun oh so did you uh, finish your career in um south africa yeah oh did well, you? i came back for one year because i wasn't quite sure whether i wanted to play my footy after we won the uh after the 1991 season curry cup i came back to new zealand and i played in hawks bay because my brother was living over there oh, yeah. and i wanted to spend some more time with him and and then i but uh, yeah I, so i played a, i played oh, i think a dozen games for hawks bay and then i then i shot back to um Durban and finished my career there. Sure. Obviously, by that time, I'd been going out with my old Lara and my girlfriend then, and now my wife, but we were pretty full on. And um, So going back to, to live in South Africa was easy, having a South African partner. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, went back and finished there, then, then it was on to coaching. Was that always the plan, to get into coaching? Um, not really. Obviously, I... My last couple of seasons as a player, I was starting to pick up some niggles and and uh, you know what it's like. You know, it's like starting to the end was near. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, you remember that? Jimmy? <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was just a, a really. I started doing a little bit of club coaching. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, started enjoying it, and then um, I looked after these uh, Welsh guys that came over to follow the Lions. They they actually rented my house in Durban. And, uh, and they were all from Swansea, and I struck up a good relationship with them. I drove them around when they want to go to the different parties and stuff and looked after them and hosted them a bit. And anyway, six months later, the, the, the chairman of that club phoned me up and said, listen, would you like to start coaching over here? We're moving into professional rugby, and we want someone that's young and we think might be able to do a good job. And, and uh, yeah, so... Okay, cool. I'm coming. So we left South Africa and went to Wales. Just the two of us. We yeah. had two two of our sons were born in Wales. So True. it was a pretty special time for us. Yeah. And how did you find the coaching? Oh, it was obviously it was pretty tough, but I was lucky that I had really good assistant coaches mm. uh, that were really helpful and um, real good club men that wanted to drive the club forward. So, and I had a really good team actually. I had um, I had about five or six, maybe even seven Welsh internationals. Um, you know Scott Gibbs being one of the main ones. He was a big midfielder that played for the Lions and and played for played had a big league break, background as well. And he was he was my captain. And True. Colin Sharvis was another one, big loose forward that played oh, for yeah. Wales. And so had some good players. And um, and then it was just a case of sorting out a system where we could enjoy um, you know changing training from the evening to the day, bringing in morning sessions, speed stuff. Welsh rugby was. 
it was a little bit slow, and I tried to bring in a more dynamic style of rugby. Mm. And uh, and I've got a, employed a new trainer. He was actually a nutritionist. He didn't have, didn't have a training background, but he reckoned he could do a good job. <laughs> so I brought him down, and he had had a bad start. Be fair, Scott Gibbs pulled his hamstring in his first session, but, he didn't want him up but anyway, he got better. And uh, he was he was really um, really into. Uh, you know, getting the plasma more explosive. We started yeah. gym sessions, hard out, and we started doing speed sessions. And and we, anyway, we yeah, we ended up winning like three championships in Did, yeah. a really short space of time. So yeah, it was. And I did one or two little courses over there. Graham Henry was a Welsh coach then. Oh, true. So yeah, I hooked up. I got a good relationship with Graham and and learned a lot from him. Successful start to your coaching career. Success seemed to follow you. Everywhere you go up until this point, but then you obviously moved to Wellington. Yeah, so um, came over and yep, got the Wellington job. Uh, I was in, I was um, actually had a job in Waikato as a RDO, just a rugby development. Oh, did you? For, I didn't really start it. Um, the job I had a John Mitchell and Robbie Dean's got the All Blacks, and they wanted me to come on board as an analyst. But <laughs> Uh, so you can't even turn the computer on. Oh, I know. Yeah, they didn't tell me there were computers involved. I thought it was just watching footy. <laughs> didn't tell me I had to plug anything in. But anyway, so um, that was that was a bit of fun for six months. I learned a lot under those guys. And, yeah. And um, then, yeah, then the Wellington job came up, and I got that, and um, moved the family from Hamilton to Wellington, and and really that was. Wellington's been a massive part of my life since, you know, four seasons with the NPC team. Yeah. And, um, and but Coops had, I really wanted to step up in the super coaching, but Coops was, um, Colin Coops had the, had the job sort of down pat here, it was going really well. And, and so I decided to go back to coach the Sharks because uh, that job came up. Did you have much success at Wellington? Because obviously you had a pretty um, strong side, always had that very dangerous back line that, Wellington was very renowned for. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, we did. Like, but we had some a lot of youngsters. It was around two thousand and two, and I I didn't know anything about the Wellington scene, so I took on Chris Boyd, who was a full on Tawa man, and yeah. and knew the club scene and everyone in, in the you know, ins and out of Wellington club rugby. So I took him on as as my assistant, and that was uh, probably the best thing I could have done. You know, like mm. he was he was awesome with me. I had a um, great knowledge of of all the players and and everyone here, so it helped me settle down real quickly. Um, and the and um, you know Malcolm Holmes, the CEO at the time, was was good, uh, good man, really supportive, and the board was really good. So I was really lucky to have good people all around me. Uh, the players, like yeah, like, like the academy, we had Mia Tialata, we had Piri Wipu, um just name two. I mean, we still had Jason Spice at halfback, David Howell at ten, yeah. and a lot, lot of really, really solid Wellington men, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, then we and then we had lots of Flair Lomi Fatau on the wing, and and Cully, and of course Tana would come back and forth a little bit, and Jerry and Rodney, um, you know, awesome when they come back as well. Um, but we really we didn't have a, we had young Fords, but not a really big Ford pack. We never really had massive locks or anything like that so mm. we were um we were we had yeah in the four-year period we made three mpc finals and lost them all how's that so, <laughs> <laughs> not a great start to my career in finals but anyway we um yeah we uh, we lost to auckland and then we lost to waikato in hamilton and that that was and then our last one yeah we lost to canterbury as well which was pretty much the All Black side at the time with Mertz and Marshall and, oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, but we did well. We we had some good. We were it was really good consistency, and we grew, we grew some good All Blacks too. Conrad Smith came through. Oh, one of the greats. Uh, it was it was oh, I loved it. Eh? There was I loved the forming relationship. Pretty Weepu obviously just got better and better. Mm. And, um, Mia Lata, like I mentioned, um, and yeah, it was a good time, man. It was unreal. So the move over to South Africa was just to get the next level of coaching, was it? Well, it was just the opportunity to coach at Super and obviously yeah. going back to, by that time, um, my two two boys were, my two boys were oh, eight and six and, and obviously my wife being South Africa. We wanted to share a life between New Zealand and South Africa for yeah. a year as well. Like it was important 
for me that it wasn't just we're going to be sitting in New Zealand for the rest of our lives. We were always going to be going backwards and forth a bit for her and and obviously the rugby scene over there I knew and um, so a guy called Dick Muir got the Sharks job and wanted me to come over and look after the Fords so I went over there and he he, he stepped up to the coaching role with the Springboks under Peter de Villiers oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and and then uh, yeah left them uh, the Sharks job available so I um, yeah I got that so and then I think five five or six years I did the Sharks Mm-hmm. And one game that really stands out for me at your time at the Sharks was the classic final, one of the greatest finals in all time where I think the score was 19-13 with two minutes to go and kick to come. You would pretty much oh. sealed the game. Talk to me through that one. Uh, you can't bring that up. <laughs> oh, that was just, yeah, that was just kills me, you know. like Yeah, Albert van der Berg, a big lock, scored in the corner and then um, Butch James – for some reason, gave the ball to Frunstein to kick the conversion yeah. instead of just knocking and uh, and Frunz because Butch had kicked all day and yeah. um, I think the boys thought they had it, you know. And uh, anyway, so Frunz missed the conversion and so it's still game on, you know. Yeah. And we didn't kill the game; they kicked off and and we were we were all of a sudden we were just playing poorly. We didn't. We didn't close the clock down. We kicked it back, and they kicked it back, and then there was a couple of knock-ons that the referee missed, and it was <laughs> it was just it was just chaos. And our president, he, he came, he was watching the game, obviously up in the in the suites, and he he jumps in the lift to come down to present the the Super Rugby tour, uh, the trophy to the Sharks, and he gets down the <laughs> lift, and we'd lost. Just at the bottom of the lift, and we'd lost. <laughs> oh, can you imagine how that could have felt? Anyway, it was just, oh, it was just, oh, it was hard to take. Yeah, Brian O'Banna scored a try in the yeah. last, last minute next to the post. Oh, man. And that was 2007, so I'd just come off losing the final to um, Waikato. And, yeah, that was two, that was the 2006 season. So, yeah, it was 2007 Super. So it was like memories are pretty raw there and now I just got <laughs> another whammy. So I'll, I will tell you this story. Like after the game, I couldn't have a beer. I was just too distraught. And I stayed around, chatting to boys and, you know, obviously comforted and they were distraught. They were, everyone was devastated. Anyway, stayed for an hour or two and then I had this big black um, Chevy V8 thing that the, they gave me over there to drive and it was a beautiful car. Yeah. Anyway, she got on the coast road and I drove, and I drove, and I kept driving. I didn't go stop, and I just kept going. I ended up in this, like, nearly in this game park way up north. And, and Lara phoned me up and said, where are you? And I said, I'm not sure. I think I'm just driving past Shishlui. And he goes, Shishlui, that's, a, that's up the coast. I went, yeah, yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't turned around yet, but I'll turn around now. I ended up getting home at, at 2.30 in the morning or something. How Five far is that drive? How long is it? Oh, it was a couple of hours at the post and <laughs> turned around. And, and a beautiful straight though, you know, not too many queues. It was yeah. just to put your foot down and enjoy the, oh. the this, put some music on and find a happy place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to get there. Oh, did yeah. you find your happy place? Well, yeah, in that car, listening to music, <laughs> going at about 180. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. that's so anyway, so anyway, and next day actually it was probably the best thing I could do because next day I felt fine, you know, it was oh, all right. You got over it. Right. Yeah, got over it in that, in that moment. Yeah. There's obviously some uh, world class players in the side that you were coaching back then. Anyone that really stood out? Oh yeah, the, I mean many. I mean uh, Bismarck Duplessis, oh, John yeah. Smith. Um, there was Franz Stein. I mentioned him before. He yeah. was outstanding, eighteen year old and eighteen. Um, true. Just Played, um, you know, never intimidated by anyone he played against. Real physical, mm. good, a good player. Uh, JP Peterson, um, Ruan Pina, one of the best players I've probably ever coached. Wow. Um, uh, who else? Well, that team was pretty stacked. I mean, we had, yeah, um, yeah, many, many, many good South African players, many Springboks. It was a good side. True. So, what brought about the move over to Ireland? Because that was your next move, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I um, yeah, the, the the sharks thing came to a little bit of a there was a change of CEO and and a few board members and um, and it, uh, they actually um, chose not to re 
contract me. So, yeah. uh, and then by that time it was, that was by that time it was pretty much time for me to. I felt like coming back to New Zealand anyway. It was sort of, but but there was nothing too much around. Joe Smith actually phoned me up when I was in Durban and asked me if I'd like to come to to Ireland. And um, yeah, I look at it. So I flew across and had an interview, and yeah, I got the job. And and uh, yeah, so it was moved everyone across, and uh, yeah, it was it was good. I enjoyed Ireland, enjoyed Joe. I learned a lot from him. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, we had some success straight away. Greg Fick was coaching. Oh yeah. Um, a guy called Les Kiss was doing the defence. Oh yeah, he's and, at London Irish, isn't he? Yeah, and. Um, yeah, we had, so it was good, and we had a good side, heaps of uh, obviously really good players, Paul O'Connell, captain. Yeah. Uh, the Irish side, was, Irish side was good. Brian Driscoll was still playing. He True. Was, he had his last year when I was there. Yeah. So it was a good side, and uh, we won the, we won the, um, what it, Six won Nations, the was it? Yeah, we won the Six Nations. Did you? Oh. Yeah. In the first season we were there. So Thank, was, thankfully, there's no final in that competition, eh? I know, and it's a real quick tournament. Yeah, well, winning, winning the Six Nations is. Um, oh, yeah, you know, get. Oh, sorry, that just went past me. <laughs> yeah, holding up a trophy would have to win a final. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's quite a good one. So anyway, yeah, so it, it, it was good. But then, uh, yeah, Boydie got the Hurricanes, and and um, and I wanted to get back to New Zealand, mate. I've been oh, yeah. away from home for a long period of time, and. And um, and look, thankfully, uh, it was a, oh, someone must have been looking after me because um, only two years later, my mum died. Oh, and, true. Um, yeah, so it was, it was coming back to Wellington with the hurricanes, and then um, spending, being able to spend time with her. Yeah. Um, over that period, I just you know, if I'd stayed in Ireland, I just wouldn't have got that those two years. So I was, so I was very fortunate. How long were you in Ireland for? A year. Just the one year. How, how were the yeah. kids and family with all this moving? Were they did they handle it sweet? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, the, the island um, leaving Ireland was really upset them. Settling them down in Ireland was pretty tough. Yeah, because just the boys were one was in high school, one was sort of in an intermediate sort of stage. Yeah, and Troy, my baby, we had in um, uh, back in South Africa. He was he was about six, I think. Yeah. So we'd settled them into school and. Um, setting the boys in, you know, they couldn't understand the teachers because the Irish accents and the dean and all of that. There were all yeah. these issues we had to get over. And and once we'd settled in, the, and the boys got quite, I only found out later, but the boys got quite popular with the, the girls. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, yeah particularly the, you know, one of them. And um, anyway, so when I told them we were going back to New Zealand, that was. Yeah, I was the most unpopular I've ever been in this family. Oh, really? Yeah. And then you can imagine, you know, if you've got kids, you imagine your time you can be pretty unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> but that was another level. I've got so that all to come. I'm still the cool dad. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, yeah, well, it's coming to me, trust me. So anyway, so, uh, yeah, so the, the boys um, weren't happy and we came back to New Zealand, but we all settled down and pretty quickly back here. The, my, my two oldest in particular, they... They always saw themselves as Kiwi boys, yeah. Uh, as much as they lived half their life in South Africa, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they were they were fine. And then, what was it like going back to the Canes, partnering up with Boydie again? Very talented squad you came in with. Yeah. Oh, that's the thing, wasn't it? I mean, I can remember us going to a camp in 2015. I think we went uh, across to Gisborne, and um, we had a pretty big morning around just our standards and values and our culture, how we wanted to tweak things. And it was a really good morning. And I can remember just standing up in front of the team and just saying, I, I don't think I've ever been in front of a group that's so talented. Mm. And uh, we had some incredible players in 2015. And Guilty. You remember? <laughs> yeah, I you do. Were, you were looking at me when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking straight between the eyes in the front row, and you were looking at me like you. I didn't. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I just and, and I just said we just got to get it. We've just. I just said the boys, we've just got to get put these things in place, and and uh, I'm sure we can have a really good year. And you know, 
We almost had a brilliant year, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that damn final. Why couldn't it be like Six <laughs> Nations? <laughs> yeah. Talk me through I that did. final. What do, you, what do you remember? Or the, even that season? Oh, I just, oh, I just loved that season. Eh? It was just, it was great. We had a really good group of boys and we, it was just a really happy group, you know, really good, happy group and really a good, and we played good footy, you know, it was, mm. it was a good group of men and we, that we, um, I mean, we. I mean, I remember that game in New Plymouth that we played. And we played the Chiefs, and, yeah. we, and played against a pretty good Chiefs side that day. And, and we didn't. We had already made the final, I think, and we played them, won that game. It was, which was great in front of the Taranaki fans. Um, and but the final, oh yeah, it was just one of those ones where it was just seemed to be fr- so frantic, wasn't mm-hmm. it? You know, it was, it was end to end, and it was sideways to sideways, and the ball was in play a lot, and it was like. Yeah, it was, and Highlanders were playing out their skin, and we yeah. hadn't seen them play like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, and it got away from us in the end, you know. And um, it was uh, another pretty upset changer, room, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Where did you drive to after that one? <laughs> yeah, no. no, I didn't. I, uh, yeah, that was the first thing. I, my wife texted me and said, "You're not driving anywhere. You're staying right. You can ride home." <laughs> So, yeah, no, no long drives. But obviously the following year you made up for it. You got the win. How was that year for you? And the difference was the defence in the 2016 year. Must have taken yeah. a lot of pride out of that because first well, team to go through the finals without conceding a try and as the defensive coach, it obviously a lot of that comes down to you. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say some of it, but I certainly won't say all of it because um, obviously the defence group with TJ and, Corey Jane and Brad, they were the, the boys I, um, the core of the boys that I had in that in that group. Mm. I'll never forget the conversation I had with CJ. We were talking around drift defence and versus a real line speed mentality, and and we we thought about yeah why don't we why don't we come up with this plan that we our wingers come in for second to last and then we put two guys in the backfield and they look after the last and and our forwards get um, yeah, we can make good decisions around the rucks and we try to. Uh, bring real heat to the playmakers of the opposition, you know, mm. to, and um, that was the obviously there was a bit more to it than that. But we had to go out and I went. I can remember going to Boydie's office and say, "Look, we're going to try." Tra- tra- I think we're two games into it in 2016. I think we actually might have lost. We lost the first so, two, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do. We lost. We yeah, we lost in um, the Brumbies, didn't we? By about Smoked, 50. yeah, yeah. And I can remember going to Boydie's office and saying, listen, we're going to change our D system, so what do you think? He goes, oh, well, I'll back you to do whatever. So okay. and I said, well, hang on to your hat because it's <laughs> going to be – we're going to have some fun with it. Yeah. And so we drove it real hard, and then the boys fell in love with it, didn't they? I mm. remember um, Vi Fafita and Michael Fadialofa being kingpins around that department for us, yeah. bringing the heat around the rucks and um, – you know, we had some good athletes um, in the front row, like Reg Goods and guys that were guys that could really get off the line and that. So it was suited our, suited the personnel that we had. Yeah. And uh, of course, the boys found belief and confidence in it, and and we just we all of us, the teams really that we played against hadn't faced it before, so they didn't really know how to how to attack it. There was probably the Crusaders were one side that were probably. More probably the following year they brought more of that into it, but I think a lot of teams around the world followed that that model of what we were doing because mm. we were found it out more later. Definitely, mm. so, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, that I think that buy-in was the key that you talk about getting the whole squad to buy into it because as soon as one person doesn't buy into that system, you're stuffed. Eh? That's where the holes open. But you managed to convince everyone in the whole squad that this is how we we're going to do it, and had some real good success out of it. So. Yeah, and, and again, I'll go back to like some key leaders who drove drove it, you know, uh, and believed in it. And uh, CJ being one, TJ being the other. So we had one guy that was organising closer in around the forwards and encouraging the forwards to get off the line. And we had obviously CJ out wider, who mm. was a really good decision maker around when to come, when to hold. And because uh, remember, CJ didn't like making tackles, so if he could get up and, and shut Spook the them out down, of it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 
if he could get up and get the winger that it's his man to, to or second last to pass the ball over there, well, he's got, doesn't have to make the tackle. So that was his plan. He'd leave yeah, it for me. <laughs> but Jimmy can look after that last tackle. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and remember how many uh, intercepts CJ got? Yeah. Yeah, from, from doing so. that, we're that. I think Jill's got one last week in the stadium here. Yeah. Just from that mindset of getting up. And now we're seeing, now it's become pretty much a norm for, for most defences. Mm. But one of my favourite things at the Hurricanes was the Monday morning when you would have your D presentation. You you knew how to run a D presentation. It was one of the best. It was like a stand up comedy slash learning review, it had everything in it. Talk me through how much planning did you put into your defense presentations? Because man, they were good. Oh, look, there's always a fair bit of planning going into any type of presentation, but I think I was with the with the boys for for you know a couple of years, and yeah, you know it was a it was, you know when you're with a group that long, it becomes a bit of a family, you know. So you feel like you're really talking to your family, so you can be yourself and and have fun with it. And um, you know, there's obviously times when like in any family, you get, you can get a bit serious too. And, mm. and, um, but it can't be that way all the time, can it? No. It gets pretty exhausting if it's always like that. So, yeah, I think, you know, I was always remember having one or two little um, conversations with you in front of the boys around your tackle technique, eh, Jimmy? And <laughs> this is how I'm up to do it. And uh, let's, let's have a look at this, Jimmy. Can you just take me through this, Jimmy? And, the the uh, Carmichael like, Hunt. Oh, still hurts. <laughs> After that um, presentation, I went for a drive. <laughs> no, you see, that's one thing that I, I wouldn't do. I, you, uh, I learned that over my career. You, you've got to pick your, you've got to pick your audience. So you would be. I knew you'd take it the right way and yeah, um, t- commentate around what. Top of technique does look like in this tackle here on Carmichael Hunt. This is not the way to do it. So, yeah, and this is what can happen as you stood up with your um, armor sling. So, yeah, so, no, it was all learning. So, I mean, oh, you're teaching the others. You're teaching exactly. The I'm happy to, happy to be the example for the rest to follow or not follow. <laughs> But one thing I used to always love getting you back with was your spelling. Spelling with Plum, a big segment in the info committee. <laughs> How is your spelling these days? I double check everything, uh, Jimmy, thanks to you. Yeah, no, I'm very conscious of that. If I write something up, I make sure even the simple, simple words just don't trust myself. You know? And stats, be really careful. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, you can have some fun with the old coach, can't you? That's some, and that's a really important part of the, the game, isn't it? If players should be able to have fun with the coaches and and the coaches have fun with the players and that what creates a, a great environment and great culture and creates, a, I guess what you could say, a real safe place. The players can see that they, yeah. can, they can smile and have a few laughs mm-hmm. and, um, and, and, and eventually, you know, it's a pretty long week if you're from Monday to Saturday, if it's all... Serious stuff, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. And you did it well, mate. You did it very well. So talk me through the transition from going from the assistant coach to the head coach, because I know it wasn't the smoothest transition, but how did it all happen? And talk me through that one. Well, I think that, I mean, obviously I head coached before in in Durban, um, but I think um, from assistant coach to the head coach with with the Hurricanes, it was really a case of um, making sure that the players were all comfortable with it. So... um, the first thing I did was bring all the what I saw as the leaders, and not and they weren't just the main leaders. They were a wider group as well. So there's about ten or twelve players, and said, "Listen, the board want me to take over, but I haven't accepted it yet until I get you your buy-in. If you want me to do it, because I'm not going to do it unless you want me to do it." Yeah. And, uh, and they all the boys said, "No, no, we're behind you." So and that was that was the start really, and the rest was just. There was quite a few things that I wanted to change from an organisational point of view. So as around the coaches, I wanted to get a little bit more organised and believe it or not, use use te- technology more. So <laughs> we were um, we were having a lot of planning meetings earlier in the week. And uh, of course, guys like Jason Holland loved that, loved being organised and loved being planned. So I was putting a big, and Chrono, uh, great. Waddy was, Waddy was great because Waddy, you know, Waddy loves that too. Like as much as he's a good coach, he needs that little bit of drive around being, extra organised, yeah. so he helped him. And um, 
and uh, yeah, it was a, a really happy coaching group because we were um, we were organised and we felt you know more relaxed because they felt organised. So that was probably the big thing. It was just getting the buy-in for the players and management getting them more, bit more, bit more sort of bit more organised and that in a couple of departments. It was it was fun. Nice. And you and you did a little bit of work with Japan during this time too, did you? Yeah, that's right. So I was uh, no when I well when I was assistant coach oh, with yeah. uh, Woody, I was helping Jamie and Brownie, and um, and I learned a lot from those two as well, which was which was great helping me for the for the future around the, the Hurricanes job. How did you find the Japanese? Did they get your sense of humour? <laughs> you know, the Japs, they love it, eh? The Japanese. They, um, I think when they can see the the Kiwi boys um, having fun with them, yeah, and um, you know, working hard and showing them, you know, the ins and outs of the game that you that you've learned and loved, that they switch onto it real quickly and mm-hmm. um, really easy to coach. So yeah, straight away Jamie wanted to bring in a because uh, the problem with Japanese rugby, is, of course, is, has has been their defence. Um, they love attack, but not big on the tackling. So yeah. so the idea of getting up and shutting space down suited the Japanese boys because mm. I said if you do that, well the tackles won't be so hard. Mm. So oh that really <laughs> they thought, oh that's good. <laughs> there were like nine or ten little Jimmy Jimmies in the back line, you know? So uh, anyway, so we worked real hard on uh, on that, and I showed them the system, and 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 they they just loved it, and they got they grew they grew and grew and grew, and we. I think the one of my last games we before the World Cup we played Georgia and who were big and physical and yeah. um, we beat them twenty seven nil. We did, I think it's the first time Japan hadn't conceded a point. True. Right. And um, in a test match, so yeah, so that and and of course you know um, I couldn't do the World Cup, but then they went on to um, become really good in the World Cup too, didn't they? Yeah. So why was, couldn't why couldn't you do the World Cup? Oh, the New Zealand Rugby Union wouldn't let me um, do the World Cup um, after I accepted the um, head coaching role for the Hurricanes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, true. You can so, do it as an assistant, but once you become a head, you couldn't. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's obviously changed now with Brownie. So I think oh, it's sort yeah. Of, it's, um, um, yeah. So, yeah, I was, yeah, it was a little bit hard to take. I'd have loved to be with Japan in the World Cup. Yeah. They were, they were, Good time, you know. Might have been a different story. They might have won it. <laughs> uh, you make me laugh. Or lost the final, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, but no, they did. They did have a very successful World Cup. Though it must have been pretty satisfying to watch that because I mean they definitely punched above their weight and the rugby they were playing was just awesome and the whole country got behind that. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, they. It was yeah, it must be. Oh, I was envious. I mean, I was actually over in um, South Africa over the the finals of the World Cup because I was working for um, Supersport. Oh yeah, uh, in Johannesburg, and um, yeah, watching the Japanese play, and you know, the South Africans were generally really nervous about that game because I think they played them in the did they play them in the quarter like or was it a pool game? I can't remember. They played them in the quarter final. Was a quarter, yeah, yeah. yeah, a quarter, yeah. Because they had lost the World Cup before, eh? When yeah. Jones was, yeah. Uh, they were generally really nervous about it. Yeah. Classic. But they just bullied them in the end, eh? They were just far too big at set piece time, and just Japan couldn't quite, didn't quite execute, I guess, their their game yeah. plan because they couldn't. And you know, obviously the the defence um, that Japan had uh, been playing against from an attack perspective was way more drift. So yeah. Scotland, Japan beat Scotland because their defensive system wasn't tough. And, yeah. and when as soon as they came against South Africa, all of a sudden the space was less mm. and, you know, the forwards were getting driven. So it's just yeah. a totally different game. Yeah. You know? Tough. Yeah. Anyway, let's get to your All Black selection. What was the process to become the All Black assistant coach? Obviously, your CV, oh, unbelievably good CV. But what was the actual um, selection process there? Uh, well, it was really a case of because um, Steve Hansen had obviously dominated, you know, the head coaching role for a fair fair while. So it was it was all go, wasn't it, for who was going to be the next one? So yeah. there were some pretty good candidates. So I was yeah, contacted. Well, you know, at one stage Jamie Joseph was going to have a go, and then um, yeah, and then, so I thought, well, that could happen, but and then. Obviously, Scott Robinson, good coach. There was, um, you know, Fozzie, who um, 
you know, a lot of experience at that level, mm. and, you know, excellent coach. Um, so there were some good candidates one Gatton talked about. So, yes, yeah, so, but Fozzie phoned me up and asked me if I'd be interested if he, if he, if he got the job, and I, and, uh, I said yes. So, yeah, he got the job. So that's, Easy. That's it, really. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever think about going for it as head coach yourself? Oh, not really. Didn't really feel like with those candidates there I would have um, had much of a chance. So it wasn't really it was really pointless. How are you finding it? You're loving it. You're loving your new role. Yeah, like uh, last year was a massive challenge for everyone. Um, obviously, COVID hit. We we didn't have any games when we were supposed to. You know, with games in June, July all got cancelled. Mm. Uh, so I think Scotland was supposed to come here didn't come. And then when we finally got it all together, we had um, we had a week's camp, I think, in Plat Australia. So yeah. it was a pretty tough start, you know. Um, you're getting to know the boys, getting to know how they worked, um, you know, and just trying to understand the um, all-black environment um, and what, what it's all about. It's a lot of learning, you know, uh, mm. for players, a lot of learning for coaches. And then, yeah, but going bang straight into, uh, you know, three pretty intense bleds were... Were, um, yeah. It was yeah, it was pretty pretty <laughs> interesting stage, and then uh, and then of course the five weeks in Australia, no family visiting, so we were over there, and you know, a couple of ch- different challenges over there. Obviously, losing to Argentina, losing mm-hmm. to Australia, and Brisbane, and um, you know, but yeah, you know, winning the bled and winning the Tri Nations, you know, so mm. um, that was the, the, obviously the the highlight, you know, but. No one talks about. Yeah, I know. Do you feel that pressure from the media in New Zealand? Like the expectation is just so high for you um, that anything other than a win is pretty much unacceptable. Yeah, and that's the um, legacy of the jersey, isn't it? It's been created by success. Yeah. So New Zealanders expect the All Blacks to win and the All Blacks expect the All Blacks to win. Mm. Um, And winning... Winning is a massive thing for, for for the All Blacks and for the country, you know. So, yeah. there, and and with that, create there is a lot of pressure, you know, because um, it's uh, you know start of the week and it's a the heck of a lot goes into it, and the end of the week you're, you're looking for a result, you know, and then it starts again. So, mm. um, it's a pretty intense environment for young players and yeah. um, and for old coaches, you know. So <laughs> it's certainly yeah, it's certainly a, a big step up, that's for sure. So. Um, yeah, it gets you, it gets you thinking. All right. Does that, what, what, what's it like watching the game? Is the heart pumping pretty much the whole game, or are you pretty relaxed, customer watching it? Yeah, I think it's it's way different watching a game from a the coach's box when you've got a job to do, and then yeah, um, that obviously when the spectator with a cold beer, you know, it's just mm. a, it's a different uh, different altogether. But um, you know, it's just. I think you. I think uh, whenever you're going to any coaching box, you know whether it's whatever level you there's there's a heap of pressure. And uh, but you know for the All Blacks, it's definitely amps up a little bit. Yeah, mm. and it's the, fun. It's, it's sort of like that bungee jump thing, you know, like you know yeah. you're sitting on that edge and you know you're, you're going to get pushed, and uh, you just hope the rope holds you. You know, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's good. It's good. It's, you like, love it. You love it. Yeah, like having a hundred bucks on a horse coming around the corner. Oh. And getting, you know, he's just sitting cool. on it. <laughs> he hasn't moved on it yet. <laughs> just wins. Hit that thing. Hit it, hit it. But what about yeah. the um, what about the media side of things? Do you, do you enjoy that side of things? Because you're under the spotlight all the time now. Yeah, that doesn't really worry me. It's all just part of the job, you know. I think there is, um, you know, as part of the job, you 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 want to be. You don't want too many surprises in the media. You want to sort of want to know what's coming mm-hmm. generally. So our media people are really important, and um, there are one or two um, different outlets that throw curly questions at you, ones that you um, don't expect, and yeah. some that aren't really relevant. You know, so you got the. It depends how you handle it. You know, you've got the, you've got the choice whether you want to answer it or not. Yeah. Uh, so it's just. Getting, getting more experienced in that department as the years go by it doesn't really worry me too mm, much. It's good stuff. And your plans, what are your plans going forward? Obviously, this year is a big one for you guys, but um, looking looking ahead, is, is a dream ever for you to be the head coach of the All Blacks? Oh, Jimmy, I'm just, yeah, I've never put a lot of plans in place to, around being 
I don't want to be that. I want to be that. I want to be that. So yeah. This is just Falls the years that roll mm-hmm. by, and you just go with the flow. You know, like I'm right now. I'm doing this, and I'm happy, mm-hmm. and and it's challenging, and it tests me in every department. Um, and I'm trying to work harder and understand more as as each day go by, and mm-hmm. and just yeah, look forward to this year. It's great. We've got 14 test matches at this stage. And Huge number, right? Time, yeah. This time, well, yeah. Next time, next month, we'll be name the All Blacks and we'll be in camp and we'll be getting ready for um, Tonga and Fiji and I look forward to reuniting with the boys and yeah. doing again. Oh, how good. Man, what a career. What a journey that the big John Plumtree's had. What a lad. Anyway, we've gone to our Instagram for some questions, John. So many questions have come in for you. Obviously, a lot were about players. I'll, I'll just pick and choose a few of them. First question, would you have a beer with Chris Boyd? This is from one of your ex- Colleagues as well. That's what's from Boydie. Eh? <laughs> well, that's from Boydie. Oh, I'd have a beer with Boydie any day. Yeah. But it probably wouldn't be a beer. He'd probably have a he'd have a bourbon and coke. So, I'd be on so are you guys? You guys? There's no bad blood between you two, eh? No, oh, I hope not. No, no. Um, we yeah we we didn't we like we could really keep in touch. But Boydie's not a big big a big communicator. And, <laughs> you um, both struggle with technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. But no, he's um, no, no. The relationships are strong, mate. Like, yeah. The one thing I do value is our relationships between, like, the co- I mean, the people I've coached with, because you work hard together, and you, yeah, you basically, you know, you live in hotels together for a long period, and so you know, I enjoy that. That he's got a beautiful family as well. Mm. Good stuff. Okay, this one this is a good one. Favorite player to coach? Oh, favorite player? No, nah, too many, mate. Jimmy Marshall. <laughs> Love yeah, I can't be your answer because I'm probably the answer for your next one. Best defender you've seen. <laughs> Best defender, Jimmy Marshall. <laughs> oh, no, right up there. Um, you know, it's not – it depends what you call a defender, a good decision-maker in defence or a good reader of defence or a good tackler or yeah. a biggest hitter. So, yeah, it's be a little bit more descriptive. What do you look for? Uh, let's go biggest hitter, hardest hitter, because I know you oh, love the collision. <laughs> the hardest hitter would have definitely be Jerry Collins. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there'd be no one that would match his tackles, some of his tackles. Jeez, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, about in, what about in the game currently? Who who would you say? Um, yeah, good question. There's some pretty good big hitters um, in New Zealand. Uh, oh, Don Papali. Yeah. Pretty tough boy, is he? Yeah, yeah. He loves a loves a bit. There. Shannon Frizzell can 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 hurt people too when he when he lines them up. But yeah, yeah I think they all have their moments. Say, eh? yeah, boys. Yeah, they all have. Them. They all want to be more dominant, don't they? You know, it's the first thing you ask a, a player, isn't it? You know, um, what what would you like to do more in the game? You know, so what are you a couple of your work ons? Oh, I just want to be a more dominant defender. <laughs> They know they know what to say to you. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> cued them. <laughs> They've worked you out already. I never said that. I never said that once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Brad Shields. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was good. Okay, a lot of questions came for this man. What's Boshier, Lachlan Boshier need to do? Oh, uh, yeah. Lucky Boshier's really good footballer, really good anticipation um, around his game and attack and defence. He reads the game really well. Um, but, yeah, I've had a couple. I don't really want to get into uh, Fair enough. What, what, what individuals have to do more, but um, Lockie's got a pretty good idea what he needs to do. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a massive following, eh? Lots of, a lot of the public want him in there. Do you, ever, yeah. do you ever feel pressure with selections around what the public are saying or not really? I don't really, um, I don't, I'd be, I'll be, you know, and this is the absolute truth, I don't really um, read a lot about the footy and mm. that. I read uh, who's playing in the weekend. So, yeah. And then I, I read a bit, and then I read the stats and how he played and stuff. That's, yeah. I don't really read about, Facts. I don't have too much respect for um, what a lot of the media say in this country. Yeah. I've got a couple of people I respect, but yeah. that's about it. And what about, what about even when you go out to like a pub or something or you're at the game, you must get bombarded with people coming up to you, giving you their opinion on who should be in, who shouldn't be in? Oh, yeah, and, and that's what, and that, well, yeah. I mean, every coach gets it and 
um, certainly being all backs league, you, you get it as well, but in, in tenfold, I guess. Yeah. And, and that's the beautiful thing about it, isn't it? And that's what Foxy and Foz have told me and said, look, you're going to get a lot of people come up to you yeah. and talk to you about who's in and who should be in and who should be out and stuff. And, and, that, and, that, and that's the beautiful thing about this country, isn't mm. it? Every, everywhere it's, the, it's New Zealand's team, so they want to pick it. Yeah, so passionate about it, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, yeah. next question. What's the best win you've ever had? Oh, any final. So one. I mean, a, couple, a couple of finals. <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, oh, with us, uh, in Sydney, um, we were we were outstanding in Sydney. We played and put on a real clinic of rugby in the first half, particularly blew the Australians away. That was probably one of my favourite favourite wins. Yeah, that was uh, a good one. Yeah. Three more questions. This one came from Wayne Taylor. Tails, he's asked you to explain oh, yeah. the trophy with John Mitchell that you've got currently going. <laughs> the Hara Cup. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one from Tails. Uh, yeah, so um, with John Mitchell, um, we sort of Waikato versus the, it was sort of a lot of rivalry, Waikato, Wellington, um, and then Hurricanes, Force. He was coaching the Force. And then... Sharks, Lions. Um, I think that was the last one. That was yeah, there was a f- we were we were at each other a fair bit. Yeah. Um, so we decided to bring in a trophy called the Hara Cup. Oh, true. It's a, it's a beer mug. Yeah. With uh, John Mitchell, John Poultry, and yeah. we're all um, sort of highlighted on there. You know, the, the our wives do that. They get it engraved and stuff. <laughs> the scores, and um, and yeah, so we and, and the winner gets presented to get trophy and then you can have a few beers out of it oh, uh, nice. when we play each other you know who's got it at the moment yeah. uh he's actually got it oh, he's yeah. actually got it yeah so uh right now looking forward to the new zealand playing the uh the england oh true yeah when's that scheduled yeah. so that's the end of the year is it oh, not this year. oh next not this year, year. No, not, it'll have to be next year oh so, next time yeah, the trophy been, goes on the line been, yeah that's right jeez yeah that'll be a game yeah Mm. Okay, next question. Keys to being a great coach. This one came in from me. From you? <laughs> Did it? You're already a great coach. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, look, I think it's really just going on a learning experience as a young coach and uh, in every department of the game, you know, like um, just picking up knowledge from, from everyone you have a bit of uh, an experience with mm. I think that's really important obviously you know if you're coaching you love the game you want to be a student of the game but it's really um, you know picking up stuff from others having your own style as well is important and and that, I understand that's okay but I think it's really important that you can um, as we you know the, the older coaches now that we, we um, you know develop good relationships with the with the boys and and um, get on with it and love it. Mm. I think it. I think it, I think you've got to be. A, I think right now, as a as a young coach like you are, you've got to definitely be a student of the game and and want to really learn and yep. And the rest will just come naturally. You know, it takes time. You know, and you learn and you have a lot of experiences that you learn from. You know, so good. Yeah, it's a bit all over the show, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, last question. This is another piece of advice. One piece of advice for someone who wants to be an All Black. What do they need to do? Oh, again, um, I would say you've got to you've got to develop really good habits that um, can mould you into a player that, um, that, that 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 everyone wants to see. So if so it's not just about talent. It's about a lot of stuff off the field that you've got to be really good at as well. Just around, you know, how you look after yourself as a as a pro. You know, so you, you know, obviously your diet and your sleep patterns and you know your training ethic and you know how how much you you love to to work. Um, you know, away from structured sessions and mm. you know, gym sessions. What well, that looks like is to go into the gym and doing recovery and those types of things. So. I think if you want to become the best in the game, you've got to develop a heap of habits um, that will, will will help you become the best in the game, and um, and that's certainly what professional, 
professional rugby is all about. So it can't be that you're just a great winger. You can you can step, you can run, you can catch, you can kick. You, that's just 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 part of it. So um, yeah, because you know there's just so much competition, isn't there? You yeah. know, and the best in the best in the business are great professionals on and off the field generally. You know, and, very uh, true. Yeah, such good advice. What a way to finish the podcast, Plum. You're you're giving off some of the best advice we've had on yet. But really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Obviously, I loved being coached by you. You're an absolute champion bloke. I've always found your hard case around the team environment. You created a good culture within the Hurricanes, especially while I was there. Um, loving seeing you on the biggest stage at the moment, being an all-black coach. Wishing you all the best for the season. I'm sure you're going to put your imprint onto this side and we'll see some donuts for opposition over the next few years with your D systems in place. But really appreciate you coming on the podcast and giving up your time. Jimmy, thank you very much for having me. Honour. Absolute lad.